So this presentation is about um, Let's Encrypt and uh, how it's going to be applied to an infrastructure of messaging brokers based on um, ActiveMQ, uh, which are deployed in corrupt containers. Um, first, a little bit about me. I'm um, Alex Barcha. I'm an Apache uh, committer. I have uh, contributions to Apache logging, but mostly I have contributions to other open source um, uh, technologies like uh, Jenkins or uh, Git. Um, I'm here to talk from the operations perspective of managing uh, ActiveMQ infrastructure and um, I hope you will find the information um, useful. <coughs> and a little bit about the context and the problem definition. Um, if you have been to the previous sessions, you've probably um, heard this already. It's about uh, a way to scale an ActiveMQ uh, messaging uh, infrastructure and have multiple uh, networks integrated in a way that uh, management of this infrastructure is done uh, seamless. Um, I'm going to talk more lately about the um, <coughs> different broker, but the main feature of this infrastructure was to uh, be secure uh, at first. Um, we gathered a lot of requirements from previous customers and we wanted to have uh, like best practices of how to deploy this uh, type of infrastructure and it started more as a playground and eventually it grew into a multi tenant um, configuration of uh, ActiveMQ that was also scalable and highly secure. Uh, we focused also on um, governance of the queues and and topics to be able to have multiple applications being able to talk to each other. The, the biggest problem that we saw was not on the first deployment of an ActiveMQ infrastructure, but was more on the maintenance. Um, different teams produce different applications, and most of the time when they need to uh, install a new version of the application, they will reinstall the whole broker suite or they lock the brokers related to an application. And it's very hard, uh, at least in a big company where you have multiple teams developing multiple apps, to be able even to talk to each other or even upgrade. So um, we saw that the, the biggest concern are actually related to configuration, patches, um, <coughs> and then when we realized that we have a lot of brokers, we had to think about topology and how to make it reliable. There, in ActiveMQ, there are mainly two uh, types uh, of reliability. It's um, active-passive and active-active, which is multi-master or um, master-slave. Um, we chose the later one, uh, multi-master. And um, this is because we saw that our infrastructure being uh, large and addresses multiple availability zones, uh, you need a uh, fail failover between, between uh, those. So getting to the operations part of it, um, today the technology trends are towards microservices, which try to make small applications, small deployments as a consequence, but many of them, so you manage them uh, independently and their upgrades are less riskier. Um, all the operations aspects actually are, are related more to risk management and to the business side than to technological side. So when you talk about a large uh, ActiveMQ infrastructure, you talk about more about risk management. Uh, the DevOps principles were um, incorporating development um, behavior like versioning your uh, code 
into operations, meaning versioning your infrastructure now, and being able to work together and both teams, development and operations, feel the same pain. Um, continuous delivery relied more on, on continuous packaging and delivering the application and having the ability to have the feedback loop from the operation side back to, to development. Uh, people, when they talk about cloud, they usually re refer to um, having the capability to request resources on demand. So related to uh, ActiveMQ, um, in our problem statement, we said that it, it, it's normal to just request a new broker on demand, on demand based on load or based on, on um, health. So these are the aspects um, that define the constraints in, in operations. You need to have high velocity and is more driven by business because any code that's not in, um, in um, production is basically uh, waste. Uh, consistency is when you manage an infrastructure, you cannot have a lot of complexity. You cannot manage each service in a different way. So you need to have a consistent way of managing all the, um, all the brokers in this case. That's why most of the clients that we saw have the same broker configuration or the brokers behave in the, uh, in the same way. Although um, we saw that there is a need for um, brokers to have different behavior. I will talk a little bit later about this. Uh, scaling, so uh, another requirement was because everything was built on the cloud is to be able to scale out anytime you want on demand to create new brokers that automatically interconnect with the other brokers and, and so the network of brokers grows. <clears throat> and the main topic of this uh, um, presentation is about securing and how when you bring a new broker online, you can qualify that that broker is the right broker to, to talk to. So for this solution, we choose uh, two containers, the Craft container and the Docker container. Any containers, what it offers, it offers isolation, failover, and scalability. Usually, that, uh, those are the main reasons for, for any containerization solution. But um, people, when they talk in infrastructure, well, wouldn't Docker solve all the problems? Well, it kind of doesn't. Because when we saw the infrastructure with different um, types of brokers, we understood that we have not only a problem of structure, but we have also a problem of um, the behavior of the system, that we had to manage both of them. And Docker um, infrastructure, they do not manage um, the behavior, they manage more the, um, the, the structure of it, of how many containers you can spin. Um, or is very limited the uh, the behavioral aspects. So <coughs> you can change how ActiveMQ brokers behave by changing this configuration. And Caraf provided these uh, hot deployments where features and configurations can be um, updated on the fly, and you can change the behavior of the broker without need to bring down um, the broker. Um, it offers also advanced logging with uh, Decanter. It can integrate with Elasticsearch. Um, the dynamic uh, configuration, um, you can also change it uh, remotely, either through SSH or through the XBIM URL. And you have a secure framework through, through Jazz. <coughs> now, Docker containers um, offer a different aspect of the um, advantages, different aspects. They are more related to um, standardization and bringing consistency to your infrastructure. Um, it of also lo offers load balancing, but in this case, we use the failover of ActiveMQ, so for exactly ActiveMQ brokers, we didn't need, but we need load balancing for 
a special type of service, which be the central configuration of the um, ActiveMQ brokers. Um, it offers auto scaling on demand and also you have versioning of the images and versioning of the containers and probably the most important aspect that we uh, choose docker uh, for was to easily upgrade um, the patches or the os so one of the things that we saw in the infrastructure that we configure is that people when they deploy the brokers they don't touch them if the team that develop the application leaves or something happens, that knowledge completely gets lost. If some other application comes, is with a different configuration that usually do not want to interconnect because of the risk of something um, fails. So patch or, or new upgrades are, are very difficult in current setup. Um, <clears throat> this is the Kurov architecture and few of the reasons we, we took it. Um, I want to emphasize that Docker doesn't solve um, all the problems. Uh, you need, for different layer of containerization, you have different aspects that you need to, to um, manage or take into consideration. I always like the analogy that in a container, you usually do not have the merchandise as it is. For example, if you um, have to transport some uh, wine, uh, the wines will be in crates and the crates will be in the container. You do not have just the wine in a container. Um, getting back to our problem definition, um, we realized that we have um, a different life cycle for different types of uh, brokers and as I said, in current configurations, brokers have a long life cycle. They, they last for, for years. Um, and we saw that the best approach is actually to, to try to, to limit the life cycle. And I will explain the reasons why. When you have a new broker uh, spinning up, um, you need to be able to, to trust the communication with that broker. And the best way is, is to use a HTTPS, uh, a TLS certificate. Um, and in order to provide that certificate, you need a, a CA. Most companies deploy their own CA. And other companies that are not so experienced, they um, have self-signed certificate for the CA or for their intermediate CA. Meaning that now the brokers w need to have a different configuration uh, and every time uh, you deploy a new broker, you need to accept that uh, certificate, you need to talk with the CA, there is a communication there, and it's impossible to manage self-signed certificates at scale. Even when you have a CA in the uh, corporation and it is trusted, um, there are constraints to, to interoperate. Um, using wildcard CA is not costly efficient if you use uh, a trusted um, uh, CA or a trusted intermediate CA. It gets to thousands of, of dollars at least. Um, so that's why we, we took a look into um, Let's Encrypt. So uh, we understood that some brokers are a little bit long lasting uh, at the edges where clients connect to, but we understood that some brokers are, can be optimized in terms of storage for persistence. Uh, they manage the advisory so they can manage the route and the failover. Um, they can have uh, processing and, and so on. So then we are talking about two layers of orchestration. One is for Docker containers itself, and the other is for the um, ActiveMQ or, or Caraf, depends on how you want to see it. Um, but these um, have two responsibilities. One, the Docker one is for orchestrating the structure and the availability of brokers in different um, regions. 
um, failover for different data centers or clusters. Um, and the ActiveMQ central or distributed and central configuration would be more for the behavior of the brokers itself. <coughs> um, also, it allowed us to um, have um, a topology that is reactive to um, load or to uh, health of the whole system. So um, this is how we started to take a deep dive into Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt started as a project in 2012, but it eventually became available only uh, last year, about a year ago. Um, it is now a project under Linux Foundation umbrella. Um, it's a standard that is a draft, is in progress, is considered to be released in September this year. Um, although it is a draft, um, Let's Encrypt is also a service that is available since uh, April, so it works pretty stable. Um, it provides free um, TLS certificates, free as in as in beer, and um, it has a little bit more about um, just generating the certificate. It has also a way to integrate with your current infrastructure and automate your process in relates to your uh, TLS uh, generation process. So. <coughs> First client was a uh, certbot. It used to be part of the Let's Encrypt. Now it's um, taken out, but it's still the default and the uh, recommended client for for Let's Encrypt. Uh, it doesn't. Let's Encrypt doesn't allow wildcards. It's very important to understand that you will not be able to uh, get intermediacy and and from that moment on generate your own uh, certificates. Every time you need a certificate for a domain or subdomain, you need to talk to Let's Encrypt. And um, <coughs> Let's Encrypt ma uh, manages both the creation, renewal, and re revocation of a, of a certificate. It follows a protocol, it's called um, um, ACME, of course. Um, Automated certificate um, management uh, environment, and the basic idea behind it is that um, when you request a certificate, usually the company that gives you the certificate also validates that your company is a true company. You have the right address. In this case, they cannot validate more than the fact that you own the DNS server. So, DNS server becomes a very from an operations point of view as a constraint it is a critical system so you need to take care of the security how to manage that DNS so um, the access to it is not um, tampered with um, so let's encrypt validates that you own the DNS and the way how it works is um, you create a request to Let's Encrypt, they ask you to provide the token on the DNS, they validate the token is there and say, hooray, you have the um, access to DNS, so please, here's the Let's Encrypt. The default presentations and configuration that you may see is about um, a p integration with uh, Apache um, or Nginx or Webroot or standalone. What those means is that you need to have a long running process, um, like a web, uh, web server, where Let's Encrypt will issue the request to make sure that you also own the server. So the, you make a request to Let's Encrypt, Let's Encrypt says here is the nonce and, and please sign this nonce with your uh, key and put it somewhere on a web server. You put it on somewhere and then Let's Encrypt based on the DNS goes to your server, not based on an IP, based on DNS, and then checks reverse DNS works uh, as well, that you own that server. And 
if you've been to some presentations here in Apache Con, they talk only about those scenarios. I find those scenarios actually to be less useful when you automate the infrastructure. The most useful is actually the manual one. And the manual one, I would have called it automatic one. Um, but instead of using uh, the DNS a, a, a or C name records, it uses the um, text entries. Meaning that you can issue uh, certificates without needing even to have a server. And that's what I'm going to present actually. Um, so in manual um, plugin, I would say, the DNS and DNS1 ECMI uh, protocol, it goes like this. Um, you have a, a script or a program um, that needs to manage your, or your TLS certificates. And you make a request to Let's Encrypt, and Let's Encrypt says, okay, please prove that you're authorized to do this. Um, put this token in your DNS text records and sign it with your, uh, with your key. And you um, provision that DNS text record and then uh, let's encrypt will validate only against the <coughs> DNS provider. So in this case, you do not need to have a web server at all. And you can generate as many certificates as you want, even if you do not have the servers online. This is very useful for a few reasons. One is that you can provision certificates before you even have the service available. As a consequence, when you have the um, ActiveMQ Brokers Live, uh, you can provision the certificates without needing to have a process even on that infrastructure that you just requested. Um, so let's say you, you request some, some hosts on Amazon, you can pre-provision the certificates before your, your even infrastructure gets available. Um, and then it verifies and, and, and you get the certificates. The problem is that <coughs> if, if that would be the whole problem would be nice and simple, but it gets a little bit more complicated when you have different orchestration layers. Uh, as I said, you have the orchestration for Docker and you have the orchestration for ActiveMQ and, and for RAF. And any operations, because they need to standardize, they need to in make inventories of those uh, certificates and your um, secrets. Um, and eventually it needs to get to Karaf. And Karaf is any other Java process, mainly they use JKS. They can use SCPKI, but they use JKS. So you need to create the certificate, you need to convert the certificate in from the PAM format to the JKS format, you need to get the JKS to the craft container, and you need to uh, reload the craft with, with ActiveMQ in it, or use the hot deployment to um, respin its configuration. So this is a rather complex um, process and if you would need to um, code yourself and um, needing to manage this aside would be would be hard but unfortunately uh, let's encrypt made it easier and when you manage um, the infrastructure at scale you need to have some convention over configuration they have a very good convention for managing the certificates. And this is the folder structure that you will see in any com on any computer that manages those certificates. So um, in order to have a software like a certificate manager, what you would need is to install the client, the certbot client on your host, can be in a Docker container or can be on a dedicated computer inside of your um, network not publicly available. So if you think of security, uh, your secrets, you do not want to expose them on a host that's publicly available. You want to be behind the firewall. So that's what I would recommend. And 
the inventory of uh, the certificates look something like this. Um, <coughs> the account is mainly for your Let's Encrypt account. You have all the history and all the inventory of all the interactions that you had with uh, Let's Encrypt. Um, and you have both for CSR and for keys and for all the um, chain and full chain, which is the intermediate C8 with the, with, the full, uh, with the full chain. It's awesome for auditing. It's awesome to know easily that nobody tampered with your DNS, especially if you have a dedicated zone where uh, you are allowed to create your uh, uh, subdomains and have the brokers isolated in that way. Um, and that's why I put the CSR and keys there to see that you have all the history with Let's Encrypt in regards to, to that certbot instance. Um, now, if you use certbot, you will use, you will see in live and in archive uh, the certificates, which is the cert, the chain, the full chain, and the private key. You will not see the P12 files or the JKS. Uh, but we love the convention of uh, Let's Encrypt and we said, okay, after you create the PEM certificate, you need to have some conversions to other formats of, of uh, uh, certs. And in this case, what was JKS. So <coughs> Let's Encrypt has the concept of plugins. And um, you can plug in your DNS <coughs> provider or you can plug in um, other type of, I would say, integration points for your uh, certificate management. And this is what I'm going to, um, to demo. Uh, besides the um, plugins that it provides out of the box, it has also the hooks, which are very similar to Git hooks, that help you automate the processes around pre and post um, creation or pre and post renewal or deletion. So this is a certbot command where you can integrate that command with your certificates and you basically do it in, in one shot. Um, <coughs> so let me have the demo real quick. So uh, for the first layer of um, configuration, we use the uh, Rancher with all the stacks. Um, these are the containers, about 100 of them only on, on a staging environment. The, but what I wanted to show you is the um, certificates. So <coughs> another aspect of inventories is that most of the time you don't have only one inventory. You have multiple types of inventory. You have inventory for your jars and words. You have inventories of your Docker um, images. You have inventories of secrets and the orchestrator of your Docker infrastructure or the passive or you, how you would like to, to call it, will have its own inventory to manage those um, services at a certain moment in time. So it's the snapshot of live and used um, certificates. Um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to issue a new certificate for a subdomain that I would suggest you, you propose. if the network uh, helps me. <coughs> a 
So the only thing that you would need um, Sure. I'll need to drag a little bit because I did not see that very well. <coughs> Is this fine? Is that fine? Okay. So the only thing that you would need is to do a git clone of this uh, cert bot. Um, one thing to notice about um, managing your infrastructure with Sharebot is that every time you run it, it will try to update itself. It uses the Python virtual environment and it will try to update all the libraries to make it not only compliant with the latest changes of the ACME protocol, but also to have the latest Python updates, security updates, if you would like. That's why um, the cert bot that you have embedded in Ubuntu or other distributions, they're always old. Most of the time it will try to execute it, it will not work. The best way to use it is to use it either from a Docker container that you uh, just rebuild it, or um, run certbot with sudo so it updates itself and then run it again. So this is a, a trick that is important to know. Um, so as I said, in a Docker container, you just clone this one if you like, but if I would do that, you wouldn't see much. And um, let's pick uh, a domain. Uh, Acna to Miami. <coughs> okay, so first to make sure it's not there. Um, Acna two thousand Miami. So nothing is there. Let's try to um, in most tutorials you will see instead of servbot auto you will see only servbot. The difference is that when you package servbot, they replace servbot auto with the servbot is pretty much the same. It's usually an alias or a symlink into the user bin, so it's exactly one um, and the same binary. As I said, manual. Um, and now you would need to provide your basic hooks. Uh, we created, um, we, we want to take a look to what plugins exist. There is binding for Varnish, Heroku, um, other DNS providers. Um, <clears throat> but we wanted to have one for uh, GoDaddy because it doesn't exist and I presume everybody or at least majority uses that. Uh, this code is um, publicly available on GitHub, Epifocal, Let's Encrypt Extra. to just just copy paste from somewhere just change to Miami so okay. 
So congratulations, you have your first uh, certificate. Now you have the structure that I said with CertFAM and ChainFAM. What you do not see is the JKS file. And the reason is I didn't use the um, hook for the generation of it. Let's do it right now. It will work something like this. I try to, to give you the steps so you uh, so I have a code too but I generated the um, the certificate for That's what happens with uh, live, of course. I have uh, misspelled. <coughs> okay, that sounds better. It's Miami, used to be another domain if you paid attention. So I will renew the certificate. This is how renewal works. <coughs> so it has been added to the key store. By default, any output that you have from your scripts are um, to um, uh, error output, not the standard output. So the key to what is going to generate is in on the error output. <coughs> and now if we um, take a look at the list, we will see the JKS there. The <coughs> P12 and, and JKS. <coughs> And now the last hook would run something like this. So if we integrate both this, um, I think this game is working. Sure. So now you integrate it with your renter or with whatever um, orchestrator engine you have. You have your certificate and your oh, it's Miami sounds good. Miami sounds good. Sounds oh, so from the bottom. Uh, third one from the bottom. Okay. So <coughs> basically, this is um, it. Uh, by default, it has all these uh, plugins. The plugins are, are split in um, two types, authenticators and installers. That's why I recommend using the, the manual. Um, the installers in uh, Apache will install the certificate in Apache. So if you have Apache and Topcat uh, behind it, um, and if you're doing the TLS uh, termination, it doesn't much matter. But uh, if you use uh, JKS in your um, <coughs> Tomcat for whatever reason, then it won't install it there. So this is uh, what I wanted to to demo. Um, any questions? That one quick. Yeah. 
So it's based on, on Tinkerpop. It's a graph um, database um, where all the... So ActiveMQ by default takes the configurations from file. And usually the URL that you give is a file-based uh, URL. But um, not many people know that you can actually use a, a URL and then that configuration is actually taken out from whatever that URL um, will give you. So everything in ActiveMQ, almost everything in ActiveMQ is plug-in. Uh, transport, persistence, all sorts of stuff is plug-in, including configuration. And there is a DXP, which is what people usually use, configuration that uses a URL. You can use data property files or LDAP. It's not used a lot. It's used by far the most used. But what comes after it's still is a URL. You can just put the file name not only HTTPS, but for that configuration, you need high availability. It can be not only one central repository, but actually can be m multiple central repositories that can be... For, for, for home, right? Yeah, four regions, yeah. Uh, I don't really want to know if it's a no balance. Yeah, 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 I totally get that. Uh, what, what, and, what is the underlying... Problem? And there are, I think, two few levels, so you have to react both on load, but you have to react on health issues of your system, and health issues if in are two types of it. One is on the um, availability of the service, which you mainly see in the Docker, and you have the healthcare service for each cluster engine. It, uh, we use Rancher because you can use either um, Swarm or um, Mesos or Kubernetes as the clustering engine for your containers. So you have that health check and you also have the health check uh, based on the traffic messages and you can always uh, take the decision to route to a new broker. Any other questions? Anybody uses uh, Let's Encrypt right now? Uh, you use it in the manual with uh, hooks or without? Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much.